But before the mic goes on, I'll just say that um, it's really nice to be here and have Dr. Sharkstein start out. Um, at the National Academy for State Health Policy, where I work, um, we don't just really follow the state policies in terms of implementation. We also follow the people behind the policy. And um, it's really a community of people around the country. And Dr. Sharfstein is one of the leaders of, of all of that. And um, I followed him even when he was at the city level, even though, you know, for work purposes, I'm only supposed to look at states. Um, and he's just been doing phenomenal work, incredible amount of passion and dedication to all the issues we're going to be talking about today. So let's see if the mic is on. And my job, yeah, my job this morning is to just, um, kind of awaken you and get you ready for the discussions that will happen later today. So I'm going to give you kind of like a tour um, organized around 10 themes that are practical considerations um, for states as, as they implement the Affordable Care Act. And bear with my Prezi. We'll see how it goes. Um, first theme, this is really now finally prime time for states implementing the health reform law. And we'll just spend a minute going back through time a little bit. It'll be three years in March from when the President signed the Affordable Care Act, and I think, I don't know if you're like me, but I try not to be naive, but I really did not expect um, implementation to stall out for so long after the law was signed. I just, you know, I knew there might be legal challenges, I knew that the opposition would not disappear, but the, the amount of time that passed from when it was signed to now, finally, where action is really getting going across the country was sh a shock, I think, for a lot of us. Um, you remember last summer, if you were like me, we have a lot of law professors in the room. Maybe you took a little time to hang out on SCOTUS blog with the other millions of people. We were all there, um, losing our appetite every morning, waiting to see if there would be a decision. And we finally got one. I think I would say the decision was a surprise. Um, I don't think we expected it to go um, and, and be all about Medicaid, but it was. And um, Hi, Jennifer. Um, and, um, you know, we'll talk more about Medicaid in a minute, but um, that was a, an unexpected outcome. We then had to wait, and I work on a website called statereform.org where we track states' progress on implementation, and we're always thinking, you know, after the Supreme Court, it's going to get better. After the elections, it's going to get better. And finally, after the elections, things really have picked up. I mean, even just traffic to our website, you know, we get a couple thousand hits a week, and now we're getting four and five thousand hits a week. I mean, there's just, states are just really paying attention now. And, you know, I don't know if you're like me, but we thought, you know, with Obama's lackluster performance in the first debate, and the economy where it was, we weren't sure if, you know, the ACA's major advocate was going to stay in office, and we thought maybe in Congress we'd have some rollback as well. And, you know, we made it through that obstacle, too. And so we're really now looking at the future. And these are some of the key exchange deadlines. Um, you know, I'll talk in a minute about the exchanges. The, the sort of open enrollment, um, the exchanges are pretty much set for the, the models they're going to have when open enrollment hits in the fall. And some of the big deadlines and things to look for in the spring are going to be um, at the state level and at the federal level, plan certification is going to start happening. And we'll know more by summer, but we'll really see a little bit more about what these plans look like and more details will arise. And then I'll talk in a minute about how long we are till some of the big sweaty deadlines for states. Um, what I wanted to say, though, is that at Nashby, where I work, we see some of the folks who were most sort of positive and dedicated to January 1st, 2014, even after the law passed. The law passed in March, and we had all our annual conference in October. And already we had these very earnest state officials coming to the conference with buttons that said 2014 is today. They were living it three years ago, and they were doing whatever they could to get their states ready at that time. So there were some people that all along have been, have been pointing toward 2014. Um, just a reminder that open enrollment starts <laughs> <sighs> October 1st. Uh, how many state officials are here? We've got Dr. Sharfstein. I, I don't want to make them sweat or cry, but that's not really very long. It's about seven months away. And then coverage starts in 306 days. And, um, you know, in Oregon, they had a ticker on their website from, like, March 23rd, 2010 on. And, um, you know, that state has not really moved from its position of full, full implementation, and uh, it's a good reminder of how, how few days remain. Um, okay. We're going to look a little bit about at governance, and I mean, you might call this politics, but it's mm -hmm. also 
an issue of kind of authority of different agents in state government to make decisions about health reform. There are a lot of decisions that have to be made. Some of them involve budget, some of them don't. There are a lot of new governance models coming out of it, and I just wanted to tell you a couple stories about this. Um, first, I'll take you to Mississippi, um, where Governor Bryant, not a huge supporter of the Affordable Care Act, not a big proponent of doing a state-based health insurance exchange, um, was poised to not really, you know, not go forward with that. And then came um, the insurance commissioner, Cheney, who's also a Republican, also elected, not appointed by the governor, who thought, you know what, I think it's in the best interest of Mississippi to do its own exchange. You know, it's going to be a free market exchange. It won't be a big government exchange, but I think we should do it. I don't think we should let the feds mess around with our people's health insurance. And the governor did not agree. The attorney general is actually a Democrat. Um, then had kind of was left to do sort of a legal opinion about who had jurisdiction and who had authority to make this decision. And the Attorney General sided with the Insurance Commissioner and said under admin law and other rules in Mississippi, I think the Insurance Commissioner can go ahead with his state exchange. And it took until it finally, there was a letter of intent that the Insurance Commissioner wrote to HHS, and this is Gary Cohen at CSIO, which is the agency at the federal level that kind of oversees the exchanges, said, Actually, folks, you know, this is all lovely. You said this letter of intent, but we need the governor to um, endorse and approve a state exchange. We can't go forward with this letter from the insurance commissioner. So that ended that, and now in Mississippi, they'll have a federally facilitated exchange. Another place to look for interesting governance dynamics is the Medicaid ex expansion debate. Um, you may have seen news today from Arkansas. It's kind of an ongoing um, We'll have to see what happens. But the governor there has all along been pretty sure he wants to do the Medicaid expansion. His legislature, he's a Democrat. The legislature is Republican dominated and um, actually blocked efforts in Arkansas to do a state health insurance exchange. Um, and so, you know, there is a concern that they would go along to support the Medicaid expansion as well. And the governor is now um, meeting with HHS, I think, in the next day or two to discuss different avenues to approach, different ways to approach the Medicaid expansion. And we'll talk a little bit more about that um, on another slide in a minute. But um, in Missouri, we have a similar situation. We have a Democratic governor supporting the expansion. We have a pretty conservative Republican legislature that actually tried to make it a criminal offense for federal officials to you know, implement and enforce the Affordable Care Act in the state. That didn't pass, but it was definitely proposed. And so we may see some interesting debates playing out there. Um, what's also interesting, and I'm sure you guys, you know, there's not really a day goes by where there isn't a news story about a governor and the Medicaid expansion, but these end states, the new states, Nevada, uh, the end states, Nevada, New Jersey, New Mexico, all have Republican governors and, um, and Democratic legislatures. And since the governor supports expansion, I think we can be pretty sure that we've got green flags there for kind of smooth sailing with the expansion. And then um, Virginia, we have Joe here, and hopefully later he works for the um, Virginia legislature. He'll tell us a little bit more about what's happening there. But it seems the most recent update is that the governor is sort of supporting the expansion, not sure. And the legislature, even though, you know, there are some um, there's, you know, there's, there's a, a strong Republican um, theme in the legislature. It seems like the, legis the, le um, the legislators are more supportive, actually, or more comfortable than the governor, but they have certain limits they want to place on the expansion. Okay. Moving to another theme, um, we've heard if, you, if you're able to participate in any of these regular calls that happen between the states and feds about health reform implementation, you'll know that there's quite a dance going on around um, wanting affirmation that certain policies are what they are so that states can move, but also only wanting that if the outcome is one that states like. So when the states like the direction that the feds are going, they want to see regulations right away. And when they don't like it, they're nervous about having anything, you know, more firmly planted. So the love story is an odd one, and it's about essential health benefits regulations, um, believe it or not. In the Affordable Care Act, you may remember, there was um, there was an element that would have required states to actually defray some of the costs of mandated benefits um, that existed in states that went beyond the 10 essential health benefits. You may remember there, are, there were 10 essential health benefits laid out in the Affordable Care Act, and some of them were already commonplace in most private market plans, but some of them were a little, um, potentially a little transformative relating to um, habilitative care. Uh, mental health care, certain kinds of preventive care. 
And then at the other, on the other hand, states over the years had passed a lot of laws that pertain to their commercial market that um, provided certain kinds of special mandated benefits, potentially for autism, potentially for acupuncture, potentially for IVF, all sorts of things. And the concern was that they would have to pay back the money spent by plans because of the federal subsidies going in um, to defray the cost of those additional benefits. So the guidance that came out a little over a year ago was quite a surprise and I think good news to a lot of states, but they didn't quite want to hear it. They didn't quite want to embrace that it was really true. It basically said that they would no longer have to, at least sort of provided a safe harbor for states to not have to defray the cost of those ben mandated benefits um, in the first couple years as long as they chose a benchmark plan that included those mandated benefits. So mostly if they chose a small group in plan in the state that already had those benefits in it, they were home free. Um, when this guidance came out, all the calls between states and feds basically went like this. Like, you sure we don't have to pay it? We really don't have to pay it. If we do this, do we have to pay it? If we do that, do we have to pay it? Just such concern that this wasn't going to last or this was too good to be true. Um, and honestly, when the proposed reg came out, they said, we need a final reg. And now that the final reg's out, I think we're finally in a place where states, at least for till 2016, feel like pretty comfortable with this element. Um, a not so happy story for some states is um, on the partial Medicaid expansion. So when you probably are aware of this, when the Supreme Court's decision came out, I think a lot of us in Washington thought it took us a couple days to get our heads around this whole Medicaid change. Um, but honestly, at the state level, particularly states with Republican governors, within 10 seconds, they'd already figured out that it would behoove them to potentially do a partial Medicaid expansion, going up only to about 100% of poverty, and then to see if they could instead have those from 100% of poverty and up, or really 101 and up, paid for through the subsidies in the exchange. Because in the exchange, states have no financial especially if it's a federal exchange, there's no financial pressure on the state to do anything. And with Medicaid over the years, you know, there are some financial costs for the states. And so um, the, the, the begging and pleading and questioning kind of started of the feds, you know, how are they going to, it's interesting, you know, you take this law and you make this change at the Supreme Court level, but the law has been left the same. And so, you know, we had to see how HHS would interpret this. Um, states said, you know, we need flexibility, let us do this partial expansion. And so far, basically what um, Secretary Sebelius has said is that if you want the high match rate, the enhanced match of 100%, which is obviously very desirable, you got to go all the way to 138% of poverty. You can't mess around with partial expansions. But, you know, this story isn't really over yet. And we saw today in the news, we've been hearing that Arkansas is looking at potentially some waiver options, potentially vouchers for people 100, over 100 to buy into the exchange, or maybe um, instead making it optional whether people go into the exchange or Medicaid. And what HHS has said is states, sure, apply for waivers, come talk to us about waivers, but you're not going to get this pretty match rate for these waivers. So, But we may, we may see a change. We'll have to see how successful the governor of Arkansas is this week with the secretary. So this is something to watch, and I think it'll be interesting to see how it plays out. Um, next. Um, the Medicaid expansion decision gets all the attention, but there actually are a ton of practical issues, and Dr. Sharfstein touched on this. I'm going to walk through a couple that states have to deal with in Medicaid, whether or not they expand. That Medicaid agency, if it wants to get in shape for 2014, has got to be moving on some of these things. And I'll just go through them at a high level. So here's... Um, Whoops. Here's the expansion decision on the left, and here's all the operational and other related things that the Medicaid agency has to worry about. Um, in terms of the expansion, oops, sorry about that. In terms of the expansion, we're now at a place where we're tracking this too, but this is the advisory board's graphic because it's a little simpler. Um, we've got kind of a majority of states leaning toward um, participating or participating, and then we're either unsure or we've got a little less than half leaning the other direction. Um, but when it comes to actually making Medicaid work, regardless of the expansion, there's just a ton states need to do. And I'll just walk through these briefly at a high level. Related to el eligibility enroll and enrollment, um, states have to maintain coverage of adults and children at certain poverty levels. They have to um, expand coverage to um, kids leaving foster care. They have to move CHIP kids into Medicaid and keep the financing enhanced for CHIP. 
and they have to think about um, the modified adjusted gross income rules for counting eligibility. Those of you in the room who've worked on poverty programs, welfare law, know how complicated entitlements are and how the income methodology is so vital to, you know, figuring out who's eligible and it comes with certain rights attached to it. And the switch to MAGI is made more complicated by the fact that states have to keep eligibility processes and determinations the way they are now for certain people as well. So there's a lot there and I'm sure there are people in the room more expert in this than me today that will probably talk a lot more about this. Um, in terms of operations, as Dr. Sharfstein said, IT systems have to be upgraded, information has to be safeguarded because a lot of information is going to be changing hands from the feds to states and uh, throughout programs, and they have to get a re an increase in primary care reimbursement rates and Medicaid of 100 percent Medicare rates up and running um, very quickly. Um, I mentioned before that some CHIP kids are moving into Medicaid and states have to be able to draw down the enhanced match for CHIP, which is higher than Medicaid for, for those, and then they want to be claiming enhanced funding for the new eligibles, the expansion, but they can't claim that for others, so they have to understand kind of who's who in order to draw down the right amount of federal money and maximize the match they can get, and that's very complicated. And states have been disappointed um, all over the map, really frustrated and disappointed with the feds for not clarifying these rules sooner and feeling like states have to kind of invent the policy and then re kind of check it and refine it again once the regs came out. Um, in terms of benefit design, in the commercial market, states had to choose benchmark plans. In Medicaid, for the expansion population, states are supposed to choose benefit um, benchmark plans that are a little different than the commercial ones. And um, it's complicated by the fact that states actually could keep benefits the same if the secretary approves that. And some of us feel like with everything that's going on at the state level now with Medicaid, Maybe just keeping the plans the way they are and getting approval might make the most sense and save time and energy and be less costly in some ways, but a lot of states are going to be slimming down the Medicaid package and choosing a benchmark, I think. And then um, they have to come into compliance with EHB as well um, and all the, um, all the coverage standards that come with that. Last, um, there's just a huge emphasis on consumer assistance in the Affordable Care Act. And, you know, a lot of states we work with at NASHB, we have this huge maximizing enrollment project. We've been working with seven states to improve enrollment and the processes and the whole system. But um, there's a huge emphasis on consumers being able to enroll any way they want. They have to be able to enroll online. They have to be able to call in. They have to be able to walk in. You know, every language needs to be addressed. Um, people with disabilities need extra help. Um, and it needs to be super accessible. And I think the hardest part, there are a lot of hard parts, but the hardest one is um, at, at, at this time, really only one state has a real point in time automatic eligibility system, and that's Oklahoma. Um, and other states are somewhere in the process of getting there, but some pretty far away still. So there's a lot that happens there, and there are a lot of differences. You know, if you're a Medicaid expansion state, but you have an FFE, there are issues. If you're not expanding Medicaid and you have a state exchange, I'm trying to think if there are any, we could look. Um, there are other issues, and so there's just a lot of complications around that. So that's a Medicaid issue. Um, this one um, is for Kevin Lucha in the audience. I have his slides here. Um, he um, and his colleagues at Georgetown have been doing a lot of work to monitor um, some of the commercial market reforms in the Affordable Care Act. And for most states in the country, this is actually, I think, the biggest leap forward or the biggest set of changes. And Brian Webb is here as well from the NEIC, so he knows about this. Um, they're just, states are really far behind on this. And it, it's complicated by the fact that some states think that they already have the authority to enforce the law, and it's unclear whether they really do. Um, so these are the big seven. There were a bunch of consumer protections that already had to have taken effect, like no pre-existing condition for kids, um, covering dependents up to age 26 on their parents' plans. There was a whole bunch that already took effect. But these are the biggies, in my mind. These are the ones that are pretty fundamental changes to the way that insurance is sold and um, in America and people buy it. And they, they apply to the whole market, not just the exchange, but the exchange kind of offers like a second look or a second chance to kind of look at these policies more carefully and make sure and scrutinize and make sure they're following all these rules. So guarantee issue, you know, is a huge change in most states before the Affordable Care Act. People were not guaranteed an offer of insurance if they had a pre-existing condition or any kind of health illness or they were too old or whatever, they could be denied. Um, waiting periods will be no longer. 
Um, there are certain rating limitations. States can't vary anymore by health status. I mean, insurers can't vary at all by health status. They can vary by age. They can vary by geography. But um, there are real limits on that that states need to put into effect and, and get insurance companies to comply with. No more pre-exes. Obviously, the EHB we talked about, um, limits on out-of-pocket costs, and then um, this notion of actuarial value and plans um, at certain levels of actuarial value, which is new to kind of try to standardize some of the plans. This is Georgetown's work again. They did this paper for the Commonwealth Fund that you can find on the Commonwealth website. And really, they found, and don't worry, Maryland, you're very close, but in Connecticut, they found Connecticut was the only state that had done all seven of the things I just showed you at, this, at the time they did the survey, which is not long ago. And then uh, about 11 more states are on their way. They've done some of the things. And Maryland, I understand, has done basically all the things. I think the one thing that remained, which I'm curious about, and maybe Kevin will tell us later, is that it looked like they hadn't taken care of guarantee issue yet. Um, I don't know. I know there's a history with a high-risk pool here. So maybe, maybe, maybe there's more to it than that. Maybe they're really done. Um, and then in California, they've done most of what they need to do, but they haven't put in the cost-sharing protections yet. Okay. This is just a little note about, I, oh yeah, go ahead, tell. Do you want to okay. tell about the guarantee issue? Um, no. Well, oh. there, there is going to be another bill this year okay. in the Maryland legislature, I think, just to kind of tie it all up. There was one last okay. year that the insurance administration did. Cool, cool, cool. But, I, fi uh, I figured you were, you're like this, yeah, you're very close. Um, I didn't want to, you know, make anyone feel just, bad. Just, just in terms of time, yeah. to keep on schedule, I think, like. Five more minutes? Yeah, maybe five to seven. Okay, that's good. Um, just a quick note that, you know, there is in the ACA um, the authority for the feds to come in and enforce if states don't, but practically speaking, really hard for feds to do that. They don't have the history of doing it. Um, it's just practically with all the states in the country really, really tough. Um, okay, let's keep moving. So one note is just that state-based exchanges, you know, everyone's talking about who's falling into what model. Important to remember that people can still use premium subsidies and actually get insurance no matter whether it's a state or federal exchange. Sometimes I think people even just lose that point. But um, really, I'm going to zip through here. This is sort of where we are. This is pretty clear now that when open enrollment starts, these are the exchange models we'll have. 17 states in D.C. are state-based. A handful, around seven are partnership, and uh, the majority of the country is FFE. Um, here's a look at who's the partnership. Everyone doing a partnership is really going to do plan management, and, and most are going to do consumer assistance too, but I was just doing plan management. I'm not going to go into this right now. We just don't have time. Um, what I wanted to say was just that the main, I think, asset of doing a state exchange, and this is my boss's new blog that I wanted to show you all, but um, it's just that... Those of you who know Alan can smile. The, um, the real reason to do it is if your state has a really um, pressing and important vision about state health policy, having a state exchange is another opportunity to align another kind of purchasing mechanism, another avenue of coverage with your vision. And so, and you know, at Nashby, we work with all states. And, you know, my particular vision may look a little more like Maryland's, but, you know, Utah has a vision. Uh, they want to they want to provide small businesses with more variety of products, more choice, um, potentially lower cost, potentially slightly higher deductible policies, and they're doing it, and they're trying to get HHS to go along with them and say that they can be a state exchange doing some of these things for small business, and this is their website. Um, and, you know, in Oregon, they're coordinating care any way they can. They're using every possible lever, and this is just a little picture, but they're going to be using their exchange to just become part of that whole vision in Oregon, a really different one than Utah. Um, couple more things. Um, this is something people don't talk about a lot, but we, my staff and I, this is something we really appreciate and find really interesting, and I think for researchers is really helpful, which is that some of the state-based insurance exchanges are really open. You can really get in there, even if you can't be part of it, and find out what's going on and learn about upcoming important decisions, past decisions. And, you know, a lot of this is happening outside of the legislative realm. It's happening in meetings. It's happening among boards. And, you know, there are a couple different models for exchanges. The model that seems to be the most open is the model Maryland has, which is quasi-governmental. It's when you have a board, um, it's usually made up partly of private citizen stakeholder types and some government officials, and you staff it. And every meeting is under the State Sunshine Act, 
you know, everything's public, everything's open. A lot of these important policy decisions are made with testimony and people listening, and mm -hmm. it makes a difference. Um, just quickly, in California, you can get, you can practically find out, like, what they're wearing today on their website. They post <laughs> everything. And um, for real, oops, for real policy wonks, like some of the folks in my office will watch their board meetings webcast. And here's just a picture from this week. Um, because of the size of the state, they're webcasting everything. So, you know, if you want to, you can learn as much as you want about what they're doing. In Maryland as well, they've got a really a friendly website. They tell you about all the meetings coming up and ways to participate. And so, you know, there's really a lot. And in terms of what researchers may need to look at policies and practices, there's a lot posted that you can use to analyze um, if you're interested in it. Okay, I'm going to try to wrap pretty soon. Just an important note that in most of the country, including in Maryland, exchanges are not going to start out as active purchasers. I think um, some wish they were, some are glad they're not, but um, this could certainly change. Just a quick note, um, there are different ways to be active purchasers. Um, states that are doing this right now are doing it in two different ways in their exchange. One is just to kind of go beyond, there's sort of some federal certification requirements, but states can go beyond those and just make add more requirements and then take all comers based on who meets those requirements. Or states can instead um, either, you know, have more requirements and then limit the number of plans they choose. Or they can even go a step further and selectively contract and negotiate prices with plans. And only a handful of states are going to be doing that in the first year or two. Um, of the states that are expressly allowed, there are, you know, let's see, seven or eight. Uh, Maryland is allowed, but in the first year or two of their exchange, they're not really going to go this route. I think this is a little bit of what Dr. Sharfstein was saying, which is mission critical, critical path to open enrollment, critical path to 2014, and then adding in some refinements and other important policy strategies later. And so a lot of states, even if they have the authority, aren't going to be able to get this up and running right away. However, there are um, California, Connecticut, D.C., uh, Rhode Island, Vermont, um, Oregon do have RFPs out. They do have more stringent requirements than federal, and some of them do plan to selectively contract and even to negotiate price. So we'll get to see a little of that in the first year. Um, FFE, when it starts out, is an open marketplace exchange. Um, they have some federal standards that are all in law and regulation, and plans that meet those can offer in the exchange. But they, you know, obviously they have to check against all the rules and make sure that they meet those rules. Um, and then there are lots of quality levers we don't have time to go into, but if states want to use the exchange as a way to enhance quality, they can. This is going to be a quickie. Um, it's not just about getting, it's not just about how many people enroll, it's about who enrolls. And so if states just sit back, particularly if they have a state exchange and they just sit back and do nothing, I think there's a concern that only people who need coverage now, who are facing pressing issues, are going to show up. So states have realized this, and California is really the champion of that, their exchange director. They are pulling out all the stops to plan incredibly creative and intense outreach efforts. Um, I was looking at California's plan. It's 142 pages, and they, I mean, they're doing everything. Um, but the issue is really going to be cost. Um, it's tough. When you look at this calculator that Kaiser Family Foundation has and you put in 25-year-old guy, this is based on someone in my office, 25-year-old guy, $35,000 a year income, you know, right out of college. Um, he, luckily he has employer coverage, but if he didn't, he only gets a $66 subsidy for the year. His coverage, the premium is $3,391 and the, with the subsidy, it's $3,325. You know, making $35,000 a year, maybe he can afford it. He's going to have to pay a penalty if he doesn't. But it's, it's tight, I'd say. And then if you look at a family of four at $50,000 a year, probably around 250% of poverty, um, their subsidy is much bigger. They get almost a $9,000 federal subsidy, but they still have to pay $3,000, almost $400 a year for coverage. And at $50,000, of income, that's, that's, that's tough. I mean, it, you know, they'll have to make it a priority. So the cost is going to be the first indicator of, you know, whether people can really enroll. But after that, um, clearly, we got to get out there and tell people about these new programs. When Rural America did surveys, this is a huge national campaign, public and private sector, to get people covered. They found that, like, it's not surprising that 80 percent of people who might be eligible for Medicaid didn't know they might be, but also, more than 80% of people that might be eligible for a subsidy didn't know. So there's a lot of work that needs to happen. States are rolling out the welcome mat in different ways. Um, last, um, 
this is the message I wanted to leave you with, which is that, you know, it's not going to be perfect January 1st, 2014. Um, we're, you know, states are doing what they can to make it mission critical, do what they can. There will be exchanges running. There will be eligibility systems running, but they're not going to be perfect. The data is not going to be running as smooth. The call centers may not be completely adequate. There are going to be some warts. Um, and I think everyone in the room has a chance to do something to help. Um, those of you who are law professors, um, Gather ideas from other states to help solve problems in your state. You know, there may be an emerging problem that someone's already figured out kind of how to solve that you can adapt. Um, if you have a state exchange in your state, get involved. Participate in that. Provide input into decisions happening now and in the future. In an FFE state, it's hard because you don't really have a lot of folks to kind of coalesce around, but there's a huge role in regulating insurance there that states still have, and there's still a huge consumer assistance role. These folks are residents of your state. They're going to call their legislator. They're going to call their insurance commissioner, and so the, those people need to be prepared. Obviously, you touch a lot of students. Educate them about the law and what it really means. Um, you have access to media sometimes, colleagues. Just, you know, tell people who to hold accountable. Talk about what the real problems are and how to solve them. And last, you know, there hasn't been a lot of time to write about a lot of these problems yet. I, I was asked to maybe write an article today, and I, I honestly feel like until 2014, those of us who do the kind of work I do are better off kind of helping solve problems than doing a lot of writing. But um, when you have a chance to do some writing, talk about what issues are emerging, what are some of the solutions, what's working, what's not working, um, and try to help fix some of these problems. They're going to need to be state-level regulatory and legal fixes. They're going to need to be federal fixes, and we need your help. Um, and these are just the 10 things again, and, um, you know, if we start conversations today that we can't finish, you're welcome to have discussions and stuff on our site. So I'll see you there.